chapter 24 capacitance and dielectrics so what's the capacitance of a parallel parallel plate capacitor it's there are two formulas for this or a couple there's c equals q over v and this just means that capacitance stands for how much charge is needed to produce one volt voltage of potential difference between the two plates so that's one formula then the other formula is this so one farad is equal to one coulomb per volt and then here you have a formula to calculate capacitance and this is what you end up with where the higher the area the more the capacitance because as you see you have these this parallel plate capacitor if you have greater area you can support more charge so you get more charge per voltage across here and then uh, the greater the distance the lower the capacitance because the more distance you have the less voltage it will be so for the same capacitance there will be less voltage so that's why the capacitance just changes or why it's inversely proportional and then these are the only two factors in for uh, constant temperature so these are the only two factors the rest are just constants so epsilon naught is 8.85 times 10 power minus 12 that's a constant and then that's for vacuum only if you have another dielectric like rubber or maybe an another insulator you need to have k give the expression that's what we did capacitor acquires a charge 156 24 volts use the formula c equals q over v so 156 micro over 24 so this is micro is 10 power minus 6 you apply it here and that's what you've done plates of a parallel capacitor in vacuum 3.5 meters 4 meters squared 8.85 farads per meter so obviously it's the other formula it's this formula 12 times 4 meters squared over 3.54 but millimeters so times 10 power minus 3 equivalent capacitance for capacitance in series they act like parallel resistors so it will be 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 plus 1 over C3 is equal to 1 over C total. So in calculator, what you can easily do is just do 2 inverse plus 4 inverse plus 9 inverse and then put parentheses and just inverse that. And you'll get that instead of trying to write the formula. And then since all of them are micro, you don't have to worry about uh, putting 10 power minus 6, you just put 10 power minus 6 at the end and you get the answer. Find the equivalent capacitance, this is all parallel so that's why uh, it's the opposite of resistors so like you can just add them up, so 2 plus 4 plus 9 which is 15. So 15 micro so times 10 power minus 6 then you put scientific notation so this becomes 10 power minus 5. Uh, 0 0.25 again this is a couple of formulas for energy so half cv squared this one you can know you just have to know one of them then you just keep on using c equals q over v and then you can substitute here so this becomes half q over v times v squared so v goes so half qv or you can do half cv squared and v is c equals q over v so v is q over c so equals to half c times q squared over c squared and c goes away and c goes over here so half q squared over c so just memorize one of them or you can understand the derivation from the internet it's just integral of q squared of q you get q squared over 2 like here and then c is a, 1 over c is the constant that you take out so apply the formula half cv squared 0 0.25 times 10 power minus 6 is c v is 400 and you get the answer again here another formula for energy like i show you the derivation 25 that's the c you put that in the denominator and the half of that 12.5 micro goes straight up forward Potential difference 60 volts 3.5 times 10 power minus 6 again another formula half QV V is 60 
Q is 3.5 times 10 power minus 6. Okay. A parallel plate capacitor has dimensions separated by 1.4. Bulk light is an uh, insulator. The relative permeability is 4.9. And dielectric strength is. Dielectric strength is sort of a measure of the voltage that it, it, the stronger the dielectric strength, the more voltage you need per meter. So it just makes it less conductible, or more more uh, charge is sustainable through the capacitor. So find the capacitance of the device. Again, you use uh, epsilon node, and then since it's uh, resistor K times area over length. Now the area we gave you this. So just change the centimeter to meter and multiply. So it's a square or rectangle. So you multiply those two to get the area in meter squared. 1.4, 1.4 times 10 power minus 3. And K is 4.9 and 8.85. You substitute it in. And you get that. What's the maximum energy? You're given this dielectric strength. If you look at the units, you can see it's volt per meter. So if you multiply it by meter, then you'll get the voltage. So to get the voltage, it's 2.4 times 10 power 7 times meter. So the distance between. So 1.4 times 10 power minus 3. And once you get that, you have voltage. Now half CV squared use the formula, you substitute everything in and you should get the, any answer. The answer. When a potential difference 175, okay, so charge density is just Q over A. So now you can use the formulas, the two formulas for capacitance, which is Q over V is equal to epsilon naught A over D. So now they want spacing, they want D. So D is equal to epsilon naught times voltage over area Q. Now Q over A is charge density. And since it's flipped, you have charge density in the denominator. So D is equal to epsilon naught voltage over sigma, or whatever the symbol is. You substitute all the variables in, and you get it. Small object. It's suspended because of electric field. It gets pushed, so it's not just hanging. It gets pushed to the side because of the electric field. So if we were to draw the free body diagram, you have the weight, and you have the tension making an uh, angle like this, or it doesn't matter like this, as long as you support it with either side. So if, if you do it like that, then positive side is here, negative side is here. Because if you want to know why, 20 nanocoulombs, so it's positive, so it heads towards the negative direction, so the rope makes the angle with the positive. Or it, it's like it's heading towards the positive from the point. So we'll calculate tension in thread. Uh, you draw the FBD, like you said, like I said, showed you there. Uh, there's also another force, which is the electric force. I forgot to put that in. Mg, and here. So to get the tension in thread, you can just get the Y component. So Ty is equal to Mg. So M is 0 0.3, G is 9.8 or 10. And then this is T1. So to get T, this is T cosine 18, because it makes it with a vertical, as you can see there. So 0 0.3 times over cosine 18, you get T, like here. That was the magnitude of the electric field. Now that you have T, you can use the horizontal component and get T sine 18 is equal to Fe. But they didn't ask for force, they asked for electric field. So electric field is force per charge. So that will be T sine 18 over 20 nanocoulombs. And you just, nano is 10 power minus 9. T, you got it from before, sine 18 is a number and then you get that answer. Find the potential difference. It's uh, easy. You have electric field, 
So the units for electric field are either newtons per coulomb or volts per meter. So if you use this, you multiply by the distance, which is 0 0.05. So V times 0 0.0, uh, sorry, E times 0 0.05 is equal to V. The E is what you got in part C. Basic 7, find equivalent capacitance of C1 and C2. Capacitance, it's opposite of resistors, the calculation method. Series, so you do the formula above. So 4 inverse plus 6 inverse, whole thing inverse. You should get like 3.2 times 10 power minus, oh never mind, 2.4 times 10 power minus 6. 3.2 is from another question. C equivalent of C3, which is this one, and C4, which is the equivalent of this. So parallel, you just add them up together. So C3 is 3.6, so 2.4 plus 3.6. You get 6 times 10 power minus 6. What's the potential difference across C1? Uh, parallel means voltage is the same across both branches. So here they have the same voltage, here they have the same voltage. So what's the potential difference across C1? So voltage is 15 across the whole thing. <coughs> so what is the same between these two capacitors? It's the charge. Because, you know, charge heads in a straight line. So if it were to be here, then the same amount would be here. Otherwise, they wouldn't flow. So Q equals Q. And then you know that C equals Q over V. So CV equals Q. So C1V1 equals to C2V2. And you know that the equivalent is 15. So you know the C is 4 10 to 10 times minus 6. You don't need to include that. And then here you can just have it x. And then c2 is 6. And then v2, what you can do is 15 minus x. Now you just have one variable. You just solve it, and you get the answer. So solve it, you get 9. Find the charge on c3. You know its voltage is 15. It goes parallel. So charge is q over v equals c. c is... 3.6 times 10 power minus 6, so 3.6 times 10 power minus 6 times 15, you get the answer. Number 8, two capacitors are connected in series with a voltage source, supply line, what is the equivalent capacitance? So series, it's opposite of the resistors, so 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 equals 1 over C total. So a way to do with this is 4 inverse plus 16 inverse minus 1. Then you get one point uh, three point two times 10 power minus 6. 10 power minus 6 you can apply to the end because it's, con it's constant, you know, micro, micro. Find the charge on each capacitor. You're given the total equivalent and you're given total voltage. And since they're in series, the charge is the same on both of them. So you do C equals Q over V. You need Q, so CV. So C times V, 3.2 times 10 power minus 6 you got, and 50 was the voltage. Then you get 1.6 times 10 power minus 4, charge on each. Now they're disconnected. And then they're connected again, but with parallel. Now they're connected in parallel instead of series. So now, they're not connected in parallel, they're connected in line, so if you assumed it to be like that and like that, it's parallel. So now, you know that they're connected like that, so charge is conserved. So on each of them, it was 1.6 times 10 power minus 4. But since there's two of them, the total is 2 times that, so 3.2 times 10 power minus 4. That's the new total charge, that's the total charge. Now voltage, the final voltage across each, you need to find that. So, this total charge, 3.2 times 10 power minus 4, is equal to Q1 plus Q2, which is equal to C1 V, since it's parallel, it has the same voltage, plus C2 V. And C1 and C2, you get it from the given above, and voltage is the same, so it's a constant. 
it's not constant, it's a variable that you have to find. So this will be 3.2 times 7 power minus 4 divided by C1 plus C2. 3.2 times 10 power minus 4 divided by 4 times 10 power minus 6 plus 16 times 10 power minus 6. That's the final voltage and then you get 16 volts. Now find the final charges on C1 and C2 respectively. Again, C equals Q over V. So Q is CV. So for the first one, CV is equal to uh, 4 times 10 power minus 6 times 16. And for the second one, is equal to 16 times 10 power minus 6 times 16. And you get the charges. BG9. The square plates of a capacitor measure the uh, area separated by dielectric, voltage rating 400 volts. What's the maximum energy? So there are three formulas for, uh, the, it's the same formula really, they just substitute C equals Q over V where necessary. So half CV squared. You have C and you have V. So you just substitute it in and be careful of units. And you get 6 times 10 power minus 4 joules. Find the dielectric constant. The constant is the K of the insulator that makes the permittivity higher. So it's K. The capacitance is K epsilon node area over distance. Capacitance 7.5 times 10 power minus 9. K 8.85 times 10 power minus 12. Uh, sorry, uh, epsilon node is that. Area is 0 0.05 squared. And uh, the thickness is 0 0.25. Put it in your calculator and you get 84.7 or 84. Something which is trailing, and then you round it up to three significant figures. Next, calculate dielectric strength. Dielectric strength is what it is in uh, the capacitance itself. It's how much it causes the electric field to be, like how the electric field will be because of this insulator. So you can you know that it's actually measured in volt per meter the measurement. So this is just a simple way to know the formula. It's voltage divided by distance. So it's voltage 400 divided by distance. So 400 plus 4000 over 0 0.25 times 10 power minus 3. And you get the answer to be 1.6 times 10 power 6 volt per meter. And that's it for chapter 24. All right, guys, let's start with chapter 25 for electricity. This chapter is mostly about current, resistance, and EMF. So let's start with the first question of the basic questions. One party. A current of 3.2 amperes flows through a bulb. How many coulombs of charge flow through the bulb in 7.5 hours? And B says a wire of cross sectional area 1.4 millimeters squared has 8.2 times 10 to the 27 free electrons per cubic meter. The electrons each of charge given charge drift at an average speed of 1.1 millimeters per second. Find the current in the wire. So I'll give you guys a few seconds. You guys can solve and then we'll check together. All right, let's check. So they've given us the current and they've given us the time and they're asking us for the charge. We should know that Q equals IT and we shouldn't just substitute because the uh, unit of time is always seconds. So it's 3.2 amperes times 7.5 to convert to seconds. We multiply by 3600 and so we get 86,000. 400 coulombs you can convert to how many significant figures you want B They want us to find the current so that uh, they want I Now let's see what they have they have the area so we should know that the formulas N A V drift 
times the electron charge. Uh, this should always be an absolute value because there is no such thing as a negative current. So let's see. Let's have a look at m. n is the number of electrons per cubic meter. They've given it to us. So that's 8.2 times 10 to the 27. Uh, 27. Let's look at a. The area. But they've given it to us in millimeters squared. And the area always, always has to be meter squared because, you know, the length is in meters, so the area has to be meter squared. So how do you convert 1.4 millimeter squared to 1.4 uh, to meter squared is actually 1.4 and then we multiply by 10 to the minus 6. So how you get this is, you do, uh, from millimeter to meter is times 10 to the minus 3, you're squaring the units, so you have to square the uh, conversion factor. Let's look at VD. The drift speed they've given us is in millimeters per second. So let's just check how you convert. You have to make it to meters per second millimeters so 1000 millimeters is in one meter this is our converting factor this cancels so all you have to do to make it meters per second is to divide by a thousand and the last is the charge of the electron which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 now all you have to do is multiply all of this and we should get 2.02 amperes I'll give you guys a few seconds to check and then we'll move on to question 2. Alright, let's move on to question 2. A wire of resi resistivity 9.42 times 10 to the minus 8, I believe, uh, ohm meter is 15 meters long and has a radius of 2 millimeters. What is the resistance? And uh, part B says the resistivity of a certain metal is 3. 2.3 times 10 to the minus 7 uh, ohm meter at 20 degrees Celsius. Its temperature coefficient is given. Calculate the resistivity at 35 degrees Celsius. So I'll give you guys a few seconds. Solve and then we'll check together. All right, let's check together. So they're asking us for the wire of resistivity. Okay, they want the resistance. We should know that the resistance, the formula is R equals rho L over A. Well, rho is given and the units are correct. L is given and the units are correct. We have the radius, we don't have the area. But what does this radius mean? Let me just show you. Let's imagine this is our wire. This is a cross section of our wire, to be precise. Let's assume this is the center of our wire. So our wire obviously continues on. We've taken, we've cut off a piece and this is how it looks. Let's just raise the rest. Let's just retry it actually. Perfect. So our radius is in fact two millimeters. Well, to get our area in meters squared, we have to convert that to meters. So 2 millimeters is in fact 0.002 meters. And we need the area, so our area in fact is equal to pi into 0.002 squared. So substituting, we should get 9.42 times 10 to the minus 8 into 15 over pi into 0.002 squared. Why are we using the area of a circle? Because, you know, the area of a circle is pi r squared. Is because a wire is a cylinder. It's like this, a very, very thin cylinder. So if we take a cross section of one, it's in fact a circle. So we have the radius of the circle to get the area we do pi r squared. And then when we solve all this, we should get to three significant figures, 0 0.112 ohms. I'll give you guys a few seconds and then we'll move on to part B. All right, let's move on to part B. Now in this question, they want us to find the resist resistivity at 35 degrees Celsius. So the formula in fact is rho because we should know that 
considering how the resistive uh, temperature coefficient is positive the higher the temperature goes the higher the resistivity so you know the resistance increases with increasing temperature so our formula in fact is rho equals rho zero into one plus alpha into delta t so it's actually what is rho zero okay into one plus alpha was two zeros okay zero zero six into what was the temperature difference 15 degrees celsius celsius kelvin doesn't make a difference because the difference is the same whether in celsius or kelvin solving you know it's uh, simple calculations we should get 2.51 times 10 to the minus 7 what's the unit ohm meter all right i'll give you guys a few seconds to check and then we we'll want part uh, number three all right number three let me just all right sorry about that okay number three a resistance of 3.2 ohms is connected to the terminals of a cell of emf 10.8 volts and internal resistance 0.4 ohms what is the potential difference across the 3.2 ohm resistor and b says a cell of emf 12 volts and internal resistance uh, 15 ohm 1.5 ohm sorry is connected across a 2.5 ohm resistor find the charge which passes through any point in the circuit in three minutes so i'll give you guys a few seconds and then we'll check together. <coughs> All right, let's start with 3A first. But let's go into the theory of this without solving, you know, let's not use the formula Im immediately. And let's think about how the theory works. Let's just draw a straight line like this. Okay, and let's just complete our circuit like this. Now, we, sh we all know that the battery symbol is represented like this in a circuit diagram, but we should all know, or what we should know in this uh, question, is in fact that the battery has an EMF and an internal resistance. This internal resistance is known as R, and the total voltage of the uh, battery itself is known as epsilon right and we have a 3.2 ohm resistor that is in series perfect so they're asking us what is the potential difference across this so what is v what are some formulas we know for v we know as a very simple one v equals i r r is capital in this case let me just fix that r but to get v we need i how do you get i well we should uh, we should know from this very formula that v over r is equal to i but what v do we use when we're looking for v we use this we use the emf which is the initial potential difference but we also have to consider this internal resistance so in fact our current is emf over we have to add both resistances why because we are in series in series we add resistances r over small r which when we solve should give us three amperes but we're not done yet using the three amperes we do v equals ir so three into 3.2 giving us 9.60 volts so what we do is we have to find the current across the whole circuit which is the emf over r the internal resistance plus the external resistance and then using the, uh, the current we find we do v equals ir to get the voltage or the potential difference i'll give you guys a few seconds to check and then we move on to part b all right let's move on to part b let's uh, first draw the circuit so you know we understand a bit better so we have a circuit like this like this 
and then you know we draw the box because we're symbolizing what's inside the internal resistance and an external resistance so this is emf this is small r this is big r they're asking us for the current so it is uh, the charge sorry so it's q equals it so again we have to use the exact same formula we have to find the current first which is the emf over the sum of the resistances giving us in this case substituting the numbers again three amperes and they're asking us for the charge and in three minutes so that's q equals three into three times 60 because seconds we need it into 540 coulombs so what we should do is you know i was just drawing a quick diagram to understand what's being given but you know if you want to uh, memorize the formulas that's perfectly acceptable so i'll give you guys a few seconds to check and then we'll move on all right guys let's move on to question four the resistance of a certain length of copper wire is 3 ohms at 20 degrees Celsius. If the temperature coefficient is this, what is the resistance at 65 degrees Celsius? And B, a cell of EMF 6.4 volts and internal resistance 0.1 ohms is connected across 1.5 ohms of resistor. Find the net output of the battery. All right, I'll give you guys a few seconds. You guys can solve and then we'll check together. All right, let's check together. 4A. We want the resistance after, you know, temperature increase. So it's the same formula. Instead of rho, we use R. So R equals R0 into 1 plus alpha delta T. Uh, we substitute, we get 3 into 1 plus 0 0.004 into 45 degrees Celsius. We should get an answer of... 3.54 ohms. This was an easy question. Let's just make it neater, I guess. B is a bit harder. All right. So we have a cell of EMF 6.4 volts. So let's just assume this cell 6.4 volts with an internal resistance of 0.1 ohms. And all of this is boxed up. Right, and then this is our circuit, yes, of 1.5 ohms. We want the net output. Now, what does the net output mean? Well, output is measured in, in terms of power, but we want the net output. So, a formula for power I know is P equals IV. But what V are we talking about here? We, don't, we can find the I, right? It's the EMF over the sum of the resistances. But what V are we talking about? Are we talking about the EMF or are we, are we talking about the V that the potential difference across this resistor, for instance? We're talking about the net output, so we have to look at the, resi uh, the resistor. So, so first we get the I. It's 6.4 over 0 0.1 plus 1.5, 1.64 amperes. Right? Now, again, we have to find the potential difference across the resistor. So V equals IR, so 4 times 1.5, 6 volts. So using this, we use we get power, P equals IV, 4 times 6, 24 watts. So the net power close, uh, of the battery is actually 24 watts. I'll give you guys a few seconds. You can check and then we move on. So when, whenever they're asking for the net output, they don't want to use I EMF. We want to use the voltage that is across the resistor. So we use I times the resistance. In this case, 1.5. All right, let's move on to question five. We have the circuit given to us. We want to calculate the current of the circuit. We want to find the total rate of dissipation of energy, find the rate of conversion of electrical energy uh, to chemical, and uh, find the rate of conversion from chemical to electrical. So it's a very long question. I'll give you guys a few seconds, solve it, and then we'll check together. All right, but before we start tackling this question, let's understand the diagram first. We can easily see we have two batteries here, right? Now we can see that the, po uh, the positive 
electrode of the battery are, are corresponding and the negative are corresponding. So these batteries are, you know, aligned. But what do we, how do we make sense of two batteries? Well, let's start by looking at the EMFs. So this is the EMF1 and this is EMF2. As we can clearly see, EMF1 is greater than EMF2. So what this is actually is the EMF1 or the first battery, let's call this battery 1 and this is battery 2. Battery 1 is actually charging battery 2. So this is a receiver, receiver, let's just fix that, <coughs> let's make it black, and this is the source, oh, IE, sorry, whatever, this is the source, oh, and Actually, sorry, this is a receiver and this is the source because the source is where it starts from, right? So we want to calculate the current of this in the circuit. So how do we calculate the current in the circuit? Very easy. It's the, in this case, well, since we have a receiver and a source, what we have to do is we have to do receiver minus source. So the EMF of the receiver or the EMF of the source minus the EMF of the receiver over the sum of the resistances. Because the resistances, you have to consider them. So the EMF of the source is actually 14 minus 10 over. We add up all the resistances. 1.5 plus 1.2 plus 4 plus 3.3 .3 to get 0 0.4 amps. B. Find the total rate of dissipation of energy. Because if we think about it, this is not an ideal circuit, right? We will always have energy losses to heat, to heat most most of the time, it's thermal energy loss. So again, we have to look at power. Well, a shortcut way, since we have I, yes, we have the resistances, a good formula is I squared, but this time, we, which R do we use? We can't just use any R, we use the sum of all the resistances. So we use all of this in our calculation. So we have 0.4 squared, into all of this, we add up all of them and we should get 1.6 watts. And this will be very important in uh, recognizing part C and D, as you will see later. Let's check and then we'll move on. All right, let's move on. Part C, what does part C say? Find the rate of conversion of electrical energy to chemical energy. So first let's understand what a battery does. A battery converts chemical energy to electrical energy. So why are they asking us electrical to chemical? I just mentioned that the source is charging the receiver. So the receiver is actually getting electrons that's coming from here to here. It's getting electrons that are coming up from uh, the source and it's converting them to chemical energy that it can store. So we have to find the rate of conversion. So we again use power, but this time we use the IV formula or I epsilon the receiver, which is four into or sorry, 0 0.4, which, because that's the current, into 10, giving us 4 watts, or 4.0 watts. Now part D. Find the rate of conversion of chemical to electrical. So this time we're talking about the source, because the source has all the chemical energy in the system, and it's releasing it into electrical by releasing electrons. So we do again, pi, uh, power is equal to the current into the uh, but the, the E of the source, so that gives us 0 0.4 into uh, 14, which is 5.6 watts. And what do we notice here? We see that the power of the source minus the power of the receiver is in fact the power lost which makes total sense this releases all the power in the system this gets some of it and some of it is lost as dissipated energy or thermal energy so this is actually a good way to check if our answer is correct 1.6 plus 4 is in fact 5.6 showing that our answer is correct because this has to be true so the power the power that is released by the source goes to two places either the receiver receives it or we lose that power or energy as heat. So these two, if we add them, we should get 
the source power. And I'll give you guys a few seconds, we check and then we move on. All right, let's move on. I'll give you guys a few seconds for number six and then we check together. All right, let's check together. A resistance thermometer, so basically what a resistance thermometer is, which it says ahead, which measures temperature by measuring the change of resistance of a conductor is made from silver of temperature coefficient of resistivity 3.8 times 10 to the minus 3 uh, Celsius to the minus 1. So this is alpha or let me just point that to this way. This is alpha and has a resistance of 40 at 31 degrees Celsius. So 40 in fact is our R0. This is T1, this is T2. So calculate the melting point of lead. Well, how do we know what's the melting point of lead? We can see easily that when immersed in a vessel containing melting lead, so melting lead at 85 degrees Celsius, the, the oh, sorry, the resistance increases to 85 ohms. So what is the melting point of lead? So we need to find T2. So we know that 85 is equal to 40 into 1 plus uh, 3.8 times 10 to the minus 3 into T2 minus 31 degrees Celsius. We would manipulate all the variables and we should get a T2 is in fact 327 degrees Celsius. So what we should do is, you know, we should recognize that we have all the variables except T2. We have all the givens and all you have to do is find T2, which is 327 degrees Celsius. And we know that the answer makes sense because if the resistance increases, then the temperature, or when the temperature increases, resistance increases. And since the, this T2 is greater than T1 being 31 degrees Celsius, we know that the resistance increasing is correct. So I'll give you guys a few seconds and then we'll move on. All right, let's do question seven, part A. An electric heater is constructed by applying a potential difference of 150 volts to a nichrome wire of total resistance 10 ohms. Find the power rating of the heater in kilowatts. And B says a 20, meter, 20 ohm metal wire is cut into four pieces that are then connected side by side to form a new wire, the length of which is equal to one fourth the original wire, what is the resistance of the new wire? Okay, let's do part A and uh, B. So I'll give you guys a few seconds to solve and then we'll check together. <coughs> All right, let's check. They want the power. So we do power is equal to, we have the voltage and we have the resistance. The formula in this case is V squared over R, simple memorization. Then we get the answer, we divide by a thousand and we should get 2.25 kilowatts. But it's part B, that's the harder question. Right, so let's see. We have a 20 ohm metal wire. Let's assume this is our metal wire, right? This is a one meter metal wire. I cut it into four pieces. So one, two, and three. 0.25, blah, 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 same, 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 right? And now I arrange them side by side. So what happens in fact is I create this one, uh, let me just draw it like that. Now there's no spaces obviously, but I can't draw them the same or else you'll see them you know, the same. Like this. And I place them side by side. So what happens here? Our length here was 1 meter. Our new length here is 0.25 meters. So what's happening here is our length is being divided by 4. But what's happening to our area? Let's assume this was A1, the area of a cross-sectional circle. Well, the area here if you think about it, it's four times because it's four wires together. So A2 is four times A1. So let's see what's happening. Since the formula is R equals rho L over A, right? So R2 is in, in fact rho into one over four of L1 because the length is being divided by four into four of A1. If we take the four up, it becomes R2 is equal to rho L over A times 1 over 16. 
So in fact, it's one sixteenth of the initial resistance, which is 20 over 16, which is 1.25 ohms. Let me re-explain this. It's a little complicated. So what we did was, we took a big wire, let's assume it was 1 meter. We cut it into 4 pieces, each of 0.25 meters, equal pieces, and we put them side by side. So our total length was divided by 4, and we put that 1 over 4, L1. But our area, since we put 4 wires next to each other, both are, all of them are the same, was in fact multiplied by 4. So we took the 4 up, it became 1 over 4 times 1 over 4, 1 over, 4, 1 over 16, and then it's the exact same as R1. So it's R2 is actually R1 times divided by 16. So it's 20 over 16, which is 1.25 ohms. Let's move on to question 8. A. A 2.1 volt potential difference is maintained across a 2 meter length of tungsten wire of given resistivity. And they have a cross sectional area of 0.5 millimeter squared to find the current in the wire. And B says a segment of aluminum wire of temperature coefficient of resistivity given is initially at 21 degrees Celsius. To what temperature must the wire be heated to quadruple its resistance? So I'll give you guys a few seconds. You can solve and then check together. All right, let's check together. So we have to find the current, so we want I. I, and we have the potential difference, so in fact it's just V over R. So our V is 2.1, but we don't have the resistance straight away. So what we have to do is rho L over A, so it's 5.6 times 10 to the minus 8 times L, which is 2, over the area, which is 0 0.5, but that's millimeter squared, so we multiply by 10 to the minus 6. I've explained before how to convert. So we do 2.1 divided by this entire thing and we should get 9.38 amperes. Simple calculations. B. We want to quadruple the resistance, but we don't even have the initial resistance. So let me call resistance, the initial resistance R0. So we want 4R0 is equal to R0 into 1 plus. We have the alpha, which is 3.9 times 10 to the minus 3 into t 2 minus 21, right? So we cancel the r zeros. We take the one to the other side. So we get 3 is equal to 3.9 times 10 to the minus 3 t 2 minus 21. We distribute this blah, blah, blah. We, you know, we so simplify and we should get t 2 equals 790 degrees Celsius. So imagine to quadruple our resistance, our resistance being 1, 2, 3, whatever, if the initial temperature is 21 degrees Celsius, we have to heat it up all the way to 790 degrees Celsius just to quadruple our resistance. It's very interesting. Alright, let's move on to question 9. A wire of resistance 6 ohms is lengthened 1.5 times its original length by pulling it through a small hole. Find the resistance of the wire after it is stretched. So I'll give you guys a few seconds and then we'll check. Alright, let's check together. So let me assume that the initial uh, length of the wire was 1 meter. I pull it through a small hole and I make it 1.5 times longer. So let's make this 1.5 meters. We want, we know that this is R1. Uh, this is given to be 6 ohms. R2 is question mark. So what do we know about this? We know that the L2 is equal to 1.5 of L1, right? But think about it. Have I added more material to the uh, wire? No. All I've done is stretch it. So when I stretch it, this is in fact thicker than this. This is thinner. And when this is thinner, our cross-sectional area, so if I cut a bit and I take the area of the circle in the middle, it's in fact less than this. So A1 
is greater than a2 but what's the relation in fact a1 is equal to 1.5 of a2 it's in fact 1.5 a2 so a2 is a1 over 1.5 substituting we should get that the resistance to is equal to rho is the same the material is the same 1.5 of the initial length over a1 over 1.5 rho l1 over a1 times 2.25 1.5 squared so we get 2.25 times 6 giving us 13.5 ohms so in this case a quick drawing is really helpful because it helps you visualize so we've stretched it by 1.5 times so every bit of the wire becomes thinner so the in, inner area is what we have to think about becomes thinner and smaller by 1.5 times the factor is the same and that's why we get 30.5 ohms all right let's move on to the last question question 10 i'll give you guys a few seconds to read it understand it and solve it and then we'll check together Okay, so number 10, we, we are given the resistances, we're given the EMFs, and now they're asking us in part A, what is the current? So I, question mark. Well, first let's just get one thing clear. In a question before, when we had two batteries, we should remember that the positives were in the same side. They were facing each other, and the negatives were facing each other. So that's why we have a source and a receiver. One battery was charging the other. But what's happening here is, the current is leaving E1 like this, the electrons are, and they're entering the negative, which is normal, and the, they're leaving the positive. So they're not charging, they're just adding to each other. You know, the current just keep on flowing. So what is the current? The last time we subtracted, this time we add. So I equals E1 plus E2 over R1 plus small r2 plus big R, giving us... 2.4 amps, 2.4 amperes. B. We want to find VAB of point A relative to point B. Some of you might be saying, oh, it's easy, it's just E1. No, it's not. We have to consider R1 as well. We have to consider the effect R1 has on our circuit. Uh, I won't go into Kirchhoff's rules and all because you know it's a relatively new material and you don't need to think about that much. All you need to know is to get VAB relative to B, it should be a positive answer because the positive is here and the negative is here. It has to be, you know, positive is always at higher potential. So in fact, it's E1 minus the charge into small R1. So E1 is in fact 14 minus 2.4 into small R1 is 3. So that gives us 6.8 volts. That is V of A relative to B. Let's do part C now. They want V, D, C. D, C will again be positive because the positive is near D and the negative is near C. So V, D, C is equal to E2 minus I into R2. E2 being uh, 10 minus 2.4 into what is R2? R2 is 2. Uh, solving, we should get 5.2 volts. That leaves us with just one part in this chapter. What is the total rate of dissipation of energy in circuit? All of this just means what is the power. But which power are we talking about? What is the only part of the circuit that is actually making us lose energy is this resistor. This resistor is uh, slowing down the flow of electrons, thus creating thermal energy. And thermal energy is always a loss of energy, and that is why we need to find the thermal energy. So P is equal to I squared, right, into which resistor are we talking about? Technically, all of them are losing uh, power. Why? Because we have subtracted them, right? They're causing, all of them are resistors which are slowing the flow of current. 
so it is i into the sigma of r's so all of them added up i squared so it's uh 2.4 squared into 2 plus uh, 5 plus 3 simplify we should get 57.6 watts of energy are be or of power are being dissipated in the circuit and this is it for chapter 25 hope you guys understand and good luck in your exam